Have you ever wished that you could start something over? To hit the refresh button like a camera um, in our service today or to, to start something over again? Whether it's a work situation, an area in the garden or a, um, a project or e even your own whole house. To reset things again and to end up in a different place to where you started last time. Today we're going to take some time to explore what it means to recreate and to change the future. Let me take a moment to pray. Jesus, we invite you to use this time for your glory. Help us to be sensitive to the things that you want to say to us today. Lord, would you, would you speak to us? Would you move amongst us whether, wherever you may find us at this time? In Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we looked at creation, yesterday, and we left creation in Genesis chapter 3, verse 11. And it was in a spot of bother, with humans sinning by listening to Satan, uh, Satan's whisper in their um, ears, speaking words of doubt and deception. Humanity was left feeling guilty and shameful. Harmony between God and creation was broken. Harmony between humans and creation was broken. Harmony between humans was broken. And personal inner harmony was also broken. As we previously mentioned, that the story of Eve and Adam picking the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it wasn't just man and woman who suffered. As we discovered on the 18th of July this year, uh, where we looked and spent some time at, uh, looking at Romans chapter 8, verses 19 to 22, where it says these things. For all creation is waiting eagerly for the, that future day when God will reveal who is his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up unto this present time. All creation groans, waiting for the day when it too will be freed from death and decay. So where does this freedom for creation come from? Where do we go? Where can we find that reset button in our life? We can try as much as we like to do things all by ourselves, but the reality is if we want to see change, then we need to go to the source of life. It comes from the Creator. As Amy read earlier today in John 3, 3-6, three to six, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? exclaimed Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives life, uh, gives birth to spiritual life. The problem of sin, death and destruction, the decay that we see in the world around us and in us, and when we see that we groan with the rest of creation for a solution. You've seen the mess that this world is in, all you have to do is to look at the news, online and in our cities and around the world. It doesn't take a genius to realise that the all creation is crying out, it's not right. There's something inside us and in the rest of creation that screams out, this is not the way it should be. So what's the solution? How can we reset things? The answer to the problem of death and decay 
is ironically death. But death followed by resurrection. John's account continues in John 3, 16 to 21. For God so loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And this judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All, they, uh, all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so that others can see that they are doing what God wants. The problem, the the destruction that was brought upon creation in Genesis 3 finds its solution, its restoration in John 3, in being born again by becoming a new creation. Repentance is about saying sorry for listening to Satan's voice whispering in your ear. Being sorry for the times that you've rebelled against God's plan for you. And by looking to uh, Jesus, his death on the cross, paying the price for our sins and his resurrection, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, gives us new birth, new life, making us a new creation. The Apostle Paul, when writing to the Corinthians in Corinth, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, explores the idea of being a new creation. We pick this up in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 19. Either way, Christ's love controls us since we believe that Christ died for all. We also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who have received his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for for Christ, who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a mere human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, how differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life has gone and the new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Something amazing takes place when people become a follower of Jesus. We become a new creation. The old life is gone. The new life and being a new creation has begun. However, there remains this tension that is created and it comes as a result of us wanting to hang on to the old life. The echo of old habits, then um, the voices of the past, still ring in our ears. And so, because of what Jesus achieved, the work of renewing our creation begins. But there's this tension between the two. And that's where baptism is such a a rich symbolic act of dying to the old self and rising again to new life. But the reality is that old habits die hard. The Apostle Paul saw this played out in Romans chapter 7, verses 15 to 25. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. 
But if I know what I'm doing, what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It's sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It's sin living in me that does it. I've discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. There is another power that makes me a slave to the sin that is within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Christ, uh, Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am still a slave to sin. Unfortunately, people have thought that the, the act of recreating ourselves and renewing ourselves, that this is somehow a cinch. The work of regeneration, of recreating, is a lifelong process that requires effort sacrifice and retraining. But it is a work that we do not do on our own. We draw on our relationship with Jesus. And we also need to put into place steps to recreate behaviours that have once become habits. Here's a few suggestions that wrapped up in prayer and with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our life, you might find helpful if you're wanting to do some recreating yourself and to make some changes in your life. The first step is to determine what is important. You see, what we, uh, we do that which is important. Our values set the standard of what we are prepared to accept. What's the payoff in completing this change? If I don't change, then what's the price that I and possibly others will pay? Remember, change involves choice. The good can at times be the enemy of the best. We also need to prepare for adversity. No change is pain-free. Habits learned over time um, will generally only change over time. What will hold me back from making these changes? When people see you trying to change, some will lift you up, while others will want to knock you down. Therefore, it's important to surround yourself with the right type of people. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Proverbs 27, 17 says, there are those who will be quick to stab you in the back, but there are others who will sharpen you. Who sharpens you? Which are you to others? Where possible, change one thing at a time. I remember speaking with a person who um, came to Northern to um, our, our community program and, and this person wanted to kick the habit of using ice as a drug, um, drinking and smoking and they wanted to kick them all at once. And I said to them, hey, that's going to be really hard to do. And I encouraged them to choose one of those things, to work on one of those habits that they wanted to change and then to get that under control and to change that habit, and then move on to the next. Wholesale changes often don't work. And if we try and make wholesale changes, then we can often find ourselves giving up and uh, wondering what's the point. And as a result of that, we can start to wonder whether we should bother to change things 
in the future and that can make those changes more difficult. So be specific. What do you want to change and why? If you need to, start small and then build on those successes. Most energy used in, is in creating momentum, not direction. Consider also what resources, what assets, what, what things you have that um, will assist you in that change. Lasting change um, are usually built on strength. So what are they and how can you use them? And make sure you commit to seeing it through. Anyone can start well and not finish. Determine to do what you can to finish and celebrate success along the way. A couple of years back I heard of an interview from a neuroscientist and they were discovering how our brain learns things and how we can change behaviour. According to various studies over the years, the brain is made up of cells in an amazing web of interconnected regions and parts, with each cell connecting and receiving information from dozens of other cells. Apparently the transference of information and emotions and formations of memories is carried through these neurological pathways at, by combining uh, by a combination of electrical and chemical changes. As we learn these pathways, um, they become well used and stronger, while other pathways become weaker and disconnect. Over time, these pathways become so strong that we can even start to do things without a conscious thought or effort. We're driving or walking, going from A to B, and we don't have to plan our trip. And when we arrive at our destination, we have no standout consciousness or um, conscious memory of the trip. Here's a short video that we're going to show, and hopefully you'll be able to track with us in it, um, that helps to explain this some more. But recent advances in only the last decade now tell us that this is simply not true. The brain can and does change throughout our lives. It is adaptable, like plastic. Hence neuroscientists call this neuroplasticity. How does neuroplasticity work? If you think of your brain as a dynamic, connected power grid, there are billions of pathways or roads lighting up every time you think, feel, or do something. Some of these roads are well-traveled. These are our habits, our established ways of thinking, feeling, and doing. Every time we think in a certain way, practice a particular task, or feel a specific emotion, we strengthen this road. It becomes easier for our brains to travel this pathway. Say we think about something differently, learn a new task, or choose a different emotion. We start carving out a new road. If we keep traveling that road, our brains begin to use this pathway more and this new way of thinking, feeling or doing becomes second nature. The old pathway gets used less and less and weakens. This process of rewiring your brain by forming new connections and weakening old ones is neuroplasticity in action. The good news is that we all have the ability to learn and change by rewiring our brains. If you have ever changed a bad habit, or thought about something differently, you have carved a new pathway in your brain and experienced neuroplasticity firsthand. With repeated and directed attention towards your desired change, you can rewire your brain. Who would have thought you come to church and you get a science lesson or a biology lesson? Um, when I hear this sort of stuff of uh, recreating new habits and ideas and, and creating new neurological pathways in my mind, I think, oh, if only Paul had have known this when he's talking about the things that I don't want to do, uh, the things that I end up doing, the things that I do do or the things that I don't want to do. 
But then I remember that this was before he gets to Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, Paul's writing to a bunch of new Christians who are trying to change behaviours and to learn new habits in first century Rome. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, we read these words. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God like a life debt. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will accept. When you think of what he has done for you, is this too much to ask? Don't copy the behaviours and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think, or as the NIV um, translates it, by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know what God wants you to do. And you will know how good and pleasing and perfect his will really is. The work of recreation in our life is not easy because it requires the retraining of our brain, the renewing of the way we use it and the way we think. God knows that because he was the one who developed our brain. He wired it to be strong so that we can develop good habits and behaviours. The challenge is, what we invest in becomes a habit for us, for better and for worse. I remember Lynette Leach sharing a message here at Northern a number of years ago, and she talked about what we feed grows, and what we starve dies. What do you feed? God wants to be involved in our life through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come, but also by empowering us to become all that God has created us to be, to live life well. The term used for this recreation is regeneration. But whatever you want to call it, God wants to partner with us in the recreation of our lives and invite others to experience God's renewing power in their lives too. Let me pray. Jesus, um, as the psalmist says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made that you knit us together in our mother's womb and the neurological pathways and and the opportunities to grow and to develop and to learn things are just amazing. But Jesus, you also know that through sin entering the world, it's mucked things up and that we develop bad habits, bad choices, bad processes. Jesus, I ask that through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in each one of us, that we would cry out to you, that we would, we would desire to be the best that we can be, to live life well in our desire to follow you and to make the changes that you long for us to do, that we see the need for. And Holy Spirit, that you would encourage us, that you would cheer us on and that we would surround ourselves with others who would help to support us and encourage us in these changes too. In Jesus' name, Amen. So as we think of responding today, I've got a few questions to pose to you. Are you still living as a part of the old creation? Then I encourage you to invite Jesus to be uh, to begin this renewing process in your life today? What might be an area of your life worthy of investing time and energy in recreating for good and for God's glory? And who might you invite to cheer and support you in this work of recreation? There's going to be some music played and I encourage you just to take some time to pause and to respond 
to these or something else that God may have been saying to you this morning. God bless you.